The next Bill Gates won't develop an operating system, and the next Mark Zuckerberg won't develop a social network. If that's exactly what you're trying to do, and you already imagined the billions in front of you, you'd better take a few minutes to find out what Peter Thiel, the man who made a fortune by founding PayPal, has to say in his book Zero to One about building companies that create new things. Please subscribe in order to stay tuned. Those who only stick to the familiar will only achieve the familiar and, in the best case, improve the world slightly. Those who instead create something new have the chance to make the leap from zero to one. Thiel refers to the former as horizontal progress and thus a development from one upwards, and the latter as vertical progress, the successful leap from zero to one. Vertical Entrepreneurship The critical question is, how is it created, this vertical progress? By companies, namely those who believe they can create something new, startups. In the 1990s, at the height of the dot-com bubble, Peter Thiel's newly founded company PayPal was given $5 million as an investment without any papers being signed. People founded five companies simultaneously and at the same time planned the IPO from their living rooms, just so as not to miss anything, including one of the biggest depreciations in human history. But the fact that billions in investment money vanished into thin air is the lesser problem from today's perspective. Even worse are the lessons learned by founders all over the world from the supposed mistakes. Anyone who has long-term ambitions today and plans more than one quarter into the future is declared crazy. Modern startups claim to be agile and flexible. Wouldn't sound bad if both weren't code words for a lack of planning. Just as naive is anyone who wants to enter a new market. Why not grow on the competition and serve existing customers? Why risk steps from zero to one if small steps work just as well? To aim for vertical progress like that of the 90s again, all these dogmas must be overcome. The Downside of Competition Competition is often seen as the panacea of the free economy, and for good reason. Increasing demand for any product immediately attracts new companies to produce that product. They compete for the cheapest offer, resulting in a wider choice of cheaper goods and services for the customer. So far, so good. The downside of this approach, however, becomes apparent by taking a closer look at the supply side, the companies. In theory, they are not only competing for the lowest price, but also for the most innovative product. The only question is if any fish in this competitive shark tank has enough time and financial resources left to focus on long-term innovation. Google and Microsoft both have lost their supremacy in terms of market capitalization to Apple through a years-long dispute over products that couldn't be more similar. Peter Thiel's PayPal and Elon Musk's X.com almost made the same mistake in their early days. Two competent entrepreneurs, two young startups in the same city, and two brilliant ideas. Or rather, the same brilliant idea twice. Had the two not joined forces instead of continuing to tinker with plans for bombs to wipe each other out, it is not too likely that PayPal would have survived the dot-com crash and dominated the market for digital payments years later. Successful startups tend to be unique, and the more they compete as everyday companies, the less they earn in the process. At the same time, unrivaled companies have more extensive opportunities to innovate and thus ensure long-term vertical growth. So the solution is as simple as it is unpopular – monopoly. The Monopoly 101 Monopolies are unpopular because they seem to make it impossible for more innovative startups to gain a foothold in the same industry. In fact, the opposite is true. Monopolies enjoy their supremacy precisely because they themselves were innovative enough to achieve it. On the other hand, those who focus only on horizontal progress are weeded out. Google certainly cannot maintain its market share of up to 90% just because their last good idea was the search engine. What these decades of supremacy actually allow them to do is the creation of countless forward-looking products under the holding company Alphabet. There are four characteristics of potential monopolies, the connection between which Peter Thiel has recognized during his career as an entrepreneur and investor. 
The first of these characteristics is a proprietary technology. You may have heard of the 10x rule, followed even by Google. If your idea is not at least 10 times as good as the best alternative, don't even try to implement it. In the shadow of more established brands and better marketing, it's quite likely that a doubling of a product's quality is merely perceived as a minor improvement. Equally important for any monopoly is rapid growth, driven by the network effect. No matter how inventive the features of that new social media platform appear on Kickstarter, most users will still prefer to sign up for Facebook. Not because the platform has a lot to do with innovation anymore, but because billions of users are already there. Feature number three is an economy of scale, meaning that each additional user not only increases your company's revenue, but also its profit margin. Almost every software company serves as an example. A new user signs up, the costs remain the same. On the other hand, a traditional yoga studio, for example, cannot take on millions of members just because the costs for a single location are covered. Last but not least, every monopoly stands or falls with a strong brand. Many have tried to copy the simplicity of the first iMacs, iPods, and iPhones, but today there's only one brand we all remember, Apple. Just as every successful company exists only once, every brand exists either only once or not at all. Many of the examples suggest a fifth characteristic of successful monopolies, being first. But this is more an option than a rule. Being first is not a goal, but a tactic, and not necessarily a good one. Competitors will try to grab your market share anyway. Don't waste your energy on fighting them, but on avoiding them in the first place by embedding the four characteristics deeply in your business. A solid foundation. The potential of each and every company is set on the day it is founded, either in the direction of an innovative future or directly towards bankruptcy. To make sure you set this course as early as possible, there are a few basics to keep in mind. The most important being the timing, because according to Thiel's law, a startup messed up at its foundation cannot be fixed. Then there is the founding team. At this point, it is usually not only the most valuable asset of a company, but also the only one besides the idea. So what does such a team look like? And while we're at it, do you even need a team? Thiel describes founding a company like a marriage. At the beginning, everyone is optimistic and looking forward to the future until the romance suddenly vanishes into thin air over the first seven-figure arguments. While a marriage without a partner doesn't quite make sense, you can totally start a business alone, but at the cost of its growth. Startups of this kind rarely make this step from zero to one. At the other end of the spectrum, of course, there's the danger of too many cooks spoiling the broth, or in this case, the vision. To avoid stagnation, the most visionary and assertive founder must take the lead and distribute all responsibilities in a way that everyone on the team has a very specific and unique task. An equally important rule applies not only to the management level, but with few exceptions to all employees. Each of them should be 100% on board. Startups are often founded as side projects, but unfortunately, not the successful ones. Thank you for watching. The text for this summary was contributed to us by Damon's Book Insights. Please check out their website at damon.io for more content like this.